Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Pivot, this is Bianca. And our topic, although it sounds a little complicated, we're going to try to simplify it as much as possible, is artificial doping in self-assembled binary nanocrystal super lattices. And just a heads up, our uh, abstract in the handout is wrong. So if you read it and you're like, what are we talking about? That's a good thing. <laughs> So it's well known that much research is being done presently to address the energy crisis by looking at different ways to harness various forms of energy. And one of the most promising ways to do this is by harvesting solar energy, specifically in devices such as active layer solar cells, which work to combine various materials such as quantum dots um, to create effective optoelectronic devices. But before we delve into the specifics of our system, I'd like to tell a slightly different story about fundamental materials. Throughout history, materials have been central to human and technological development. So if we take a look at the periodic table, and we start with the Bronze Age, we can see how copper and tin came together to open an immense amount of doors in terms of different materials and expanded trade, followed by the Iron Age, in which advanced weaponry and decorative design completely changed the scope of human warfare. Today, we find ourselves in the Semiconductor Age, in which silicon's versatility for integrated circuits has completely altered the way that we process information and interact with each other. But if we return to our initial problem, we see a different picture. So this is a very well-publicized chart um, that basically shows us the efficiency of state-of-the-art solar devices today. And despite all of the work being done in this field, progress is still incremental. So returning to our periodic table, um, if you actually take a look at most effective devices today, we don't actually just use one element. We would combine, for instance, silicon with boron or phosphorus to improve the properties of the material. So what this means for us is that we actually need to look further than the periodic table to, com to, do, to combine materials to do more than anything you could do with one specific material. So for our project, we looked at using artificial doping to produce ideal systems that ultimately could have applications for optoelectronic devices. So what is doping, you ask? Well, essentially doping is when you take a material and you introduce impurities to alter the properties of that base material. So for us specifically, for our project, we were looking at improving the electronic properties of materials. Um, and the way that we went about doing this was by assembling uh, ordered structures, which are known as binary super lattices. And essentially what that means is that you take two components and you put them together to create metamaterials to carefully tune and maximize the properties to work towards ideal systems. So if you take a look at these images here, these are some examples of the types of super lattices that can be created in our group. And you can see that there's a wide array of structures that can be made by altering the size and shape of these particles. These images were taken using a transmission electron microscope, which is the primary method that we use to characterize our films in our project, which we'll get into a little bit further. But essentially what you need to know for this is that binary super lattices are metamaterials through which we are able to control properties to achieve more than we could achieve with one element. Um, and so for our specific project, we worked on creating binary super lattices that combined quantum, semiconducting quantum dots with plasmatic, go plasmatic gold materials to achieve maximum properties. So what is a quantum dot? Quantum dots are semiconducting nanocrystals that exhibit confinement in all three dimensions. And what this means for us is that you can alter the properties of this material simply by changing the size. So if you take a look at the, this image here, what you can see is that with increasing particle size, you actually decrease the band gap. And that means that we can change what wavelength of light this material absorbs simply by altering the size, which means that simply by changing the synthesis process with one material, we're able to capture a large portion of the solar spectrum, which is really, really exciting. So basically, these quantum dots have high tunability. But going beyond that, they don't, only, they don't just have good absorption properties. They also are incredibly solution processable, which means that we can stabilize them in various solvents and easily deposit them onto different substrates, which means that they have a lot of potential for device fabrication. Our group has a long history of producing high quality materials that can be used for energy harvesting applications, specifically solar applications. So if you take a look at this image of these vials, um, these are different cadmium selenide quantum dots that were synthesized in our lab. And you can see that we have good control over the size and we can create a variety of different sizes of this particle, which allows us to take advantage of cadmium selenide's wide absorption window because of the high tunability. So while these materials do have very, very good absorption processes, they actually don't have 
fantastic charge transport properties. So the goal, the overall goal, motivation behind our project was to actually increase the efficiency of quantum dot synthesized solar cells by improving all of these properties in these systems. And the way that we went about doing this was by creating these order super lattice structures that I mentioned earlier to model ideal systems. So coupled nanoparticle assemblies actually serve as observable models of atomic doping phenomena. And so for our systems, we chose to use gold, plasmonic gold particles to act as the dopants in this system. And gold was selected because it improves the scattering cross-section of the material, which improves the absorption properties. And in addition, gold can actually improve the electronic properties of the material by improving the electron charge tra transport. So in this system, we carefully pr produce gold to uh, match the size of the cadmium selenide quantum dots so it could fit carefully into the lattice, lattices that we assembled. And the aim of our project was to produce monolayer films in order to gain fundamental insights into the doping phenomena of these systems. So just to summarize again what we went about uh, trying to achieve, uh, we wanted to assemble these binary super lattice monolayers, and then we wanted to characterize them to get, again, insight on the doping behavior. We went about doing this by a method known as self-assembly, which is essentially like it's a spontaneous organization of multi-component nanocrystals into an ordered structure, in, in this case, the binary super lattices that we're trying, the monolayer binary super lattice that we're trying to get. So how we did this was taking a solution of the cadmium selenide and the gold nanoparticles and depositing them on a liquid subface. And as it spread out on the subface and we let it sit for a bit, the solvent would evaporate, leaving just the nanoparticles that had self-assembled as a monolayer film on the surface of the subface. We can then deposit this onto a TEM grid and take it for image analysis in a TEM. As you can see, the image on the far left is that one of, a T one of the TEM images we got, which can be seen, the gold particles can be clearly seen as the darker spots because of the high contrast that they have with the cadmium selenide. And what we wanted to study was how the dispersion of the gold particles was in this film, as well as how closely packed they were. Our hypothesis was that uh, so there would be like the packing of the film would be a hexagonal close packing, which essentially means that each particle is surrounded by six other particles in a hexagon structure. So the way we went about doing this is by making Voronoi tessellations, which is simply a image analysis uh, device, which where you combine where you uh, match the nearest neighbors with a line and then make draw a bisector of these lines of the nearest neighbor of the particles, and then once all the bisectors inter uh, interact with each other and you, you join all of them, you get basically a polygon or like a cell, which we can uh, use as a cell. So we use the positions of the gold nanoparticles, you can see in the second image, and from that we created more tessellation of them for analysis to see well, how, the, how many sides that the, the polygons can have, and once you have that, if it's like six-sided, you can like extrapolate that we got some sort of hexagonal close packing. Uh, we settled down on four different concentrations, and as you can see, with increasing concentrations, the amount of particles seen in the film, or gold particles, increased, as well as the area of the polygons decreased, as you would expect, because there would be more particles closer to each other, so the bisectors would be much uh, interacting a lot closer to each other. So from this analysis, we were able to examine two key parameters that told us about the distribution of dopant particles in our films. And these parameters were the nearest neighbor distances and the number of edges of these Voronoi polyhedra. So if you look at the top set of histograms here, you can see that we were able to achieve, uh, uh, those represent the nearest neighbor distances. You can see that we were able to achieve log normal distributions, so the particles kind of sat at one most frequently held nearest neighbor distance. You're also able to see that with increasing concentration, um, the nearest neighbor distance between particles decreased as we would expect. If you take a look at the bottom set of histograms, which depict the no average number of edges um, per polyhedron, with the two highest concentrations, we were able to achieve a peak value of six edges, which does indicate that we were able to achieve hexagonal close packing. With the two lower concentrations, we see a peak closer to five, which indicates that we simply didn't have a high enough concentration in those films to achieve close packing, and so there was slightly more spatial variation. So essentially, we were able to quantitatively determine that there was a random distribution of dopants in these films. So from our studies, we were able to establish that we had determined the optimal conditions for a monolayer formation of binary superlattices, which is actually something that many groups have struggled with in the past. We were also able to demonstrate, as I just showed, 
that there is a random distribution of dopant particles in these films. And we established that it would be interesting for future studies to examine lattice mismatch effects. So as I mentioned earlier, for our studies, we used gold particles that were carefully synthesized to match the exact size of our quantum dots. However, in future studies, it would be interesting to try different sizes of gold particles um, to see how that induced lattice strain would impart defect phenomena on these films. And again, we could gain some fundamental insights into the atomic phenomena that we could observe in nanocrystal form. So why does any of this matter? Well, as I mentioned before, we were able to gain fundamental insights into the doping behavior. Um, and we were able to, de to demonstrate that we know the exactly where these particles are going to be, and we're able to control the position of these particles in a uniform manner. And that brings us closer to being able to achieve ideal atomic, atomically doped systems. We were able to effectively demonstrate that we can couple plasmonic materials with quantum dot systems in artificial doping, again, in a way that would bring us closer to being able to achieve effective optoelectronic devices. And ultimately, if we can improve these systems and create the most ideal systems possible, then we're able to create thinner active layers in these solar cells, which would result in smaller devices overall, which would be good news for everybody. Oh, we'd just like to thank the Murray, everyone in the Murray group, especially Matteo and Ben, who we worked, for, who worked with the entire year. And outside the uh, Murray group, we want to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Gianola and uh, PhD student Nicholas Schneider for their help throughout the project. Also, we have a poster outside, so. If you want to check it out afterwards you during your lunch break. <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, hi, you talked about, you talked about um, using these enhanced materials and symbolatuses to improve several existing technologies. Do you see it? Do you see using these advanced materials? Um, how do you see these advanced materials as opening any, like, you talked about the pages developing based on the materials. So do you see any? It's an excellent question. Um, so in terms of how we were looking at this project, the immediate scope of it was on existing technologies. But again, this concept of being able to combine elements has infinite applications. Um, personally, I have specifically been interested in energy applications. But again, if you can combine materials effectively to based on shape, um, and size, you can theoretically combine any combination of properties. So I, I would say the applications are pretty limitless. Um, did you have any specific thoughts um, on that? Or no, I didn't. You were just curious as to general. OK. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.